All right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the January meeting of the Ottawa Centre Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. I hope everyone had a fantastic holiday with uh, lots of celebration. Uh, we've got a fantastic program in store for you today. Uh, we'll start off with Dave Chisholm giving us uh, a rundown of the Ottawa skies in January, and hopefully it'll be more than just clouds. Uh, second, we'll have uh, Dr. Lockie Scott giving us uh, a Canadian Space Situational Awareness Briefing. Uh, then we'll go to the break. Uh, we'll have uh, an update on some international outreach. Uh, and Tim Cole will be taking us through the exciting lunar eclipse coming up at the end of January. Uh, and then we'll have our observations and observation challenges. And then other various announcements. Uh, so, uh, here are new members for the past month. Uh, welcome new members. Thank you for joining. And I suspect the next month we'll have the list of members for, uh, for 2019. But we had 60 new members in 2018, so that's fantastic. Alrighty, members in the news. Can't see over here, but uh, it's a picture from Peter and Deborah Saravola. That's awesome. Yep. All right, that's it for uh, members in the news, and I'll hand it off to uh, Dave to take us through Ottawa Skies. Okay, I can't promise uh, no cloud cover at that time of year, but let's take a look at the skies. So this is the uh, lunar calendar for the month, and uh, of course you see that special orange moon there. Everybody's probably aware of this with the lunar eclipse uh, from the 20th to the 21st. Uh, that also happens to be a, what they call a supermoon, it's closest to the Earth. Uh, this is the first of three supermoons in 2019, the others falling on February 19th and March the 21st. Because we're getting a very long and detailed presentation later on uh, on, the, on the lunar eclipse, I, I'll just quickly skim by this slide. You need to be up and awake at 12.12 for the full effect. We have the uh, Quadrants meteor shower. Um, it happened last night, but of course it, it, it's, it's around that time and uh, 40 meteors per hour, and uh, with no cloud cover, uh, the moon will be a thin crescent, and it should be a good time to view them. Mercury uh, is not visible. Venus is visible in the early morning, and the greatest western elongation is on January the 6th. Mars is visible the first part of the evening. Jupiter is visible just before sunrise, there's a con conjunction of Venus and Jupiter on January the 22nd. The two planets will be 2.4 degrees apart in the early morning. Saturn is not visible. Uranus is visible all night, and Neptune is visible the early part of the evening. And there's our cartoon of the month. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. All right, up next, uh, we're gonna have a uh, presentation from our special guest, Dr. Lockie Scott. Uh, Dr. Scott is the lead scientist in space situational awareness R&D project at uh, Defense R&D Canada, uh, and is the principal investigator on the Neosat space situational awareness R&D mission. He has 16 years experience developing automated robotic telescopes for SSA and research operations of uh, small orbiting space telescopes designed for space surveillance. Uh, so Dr. Scott will be giving us an overview of Canadian space situational awareness research and development activities at uh, Defence R&D Canada. Dr. Scott. Thank you very much. Well, I'd like to thank everybody for the opportunity to come and talk today. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about something, a little bit of a variation on astronomy, how we basically apply astronomy to a defence and security area. I never thought that when I'd be doing um, when I'd be doing my uh, undergraduate studies, that eventually I would evolve my career from a path of engineering, merge astronomy, aerospace engineering, a little bit of space sciences, and 
start looking at the orbital environment above us as the uh, basically the uh, the basically the, the, the cornerstone of my career. I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about some uh, some of the space situational awareness projects we've been doing. I run uh, one type of satellite. I'm the principal investigator on on, on EOSAT's SSA mission. I also do quite a bit of work on the Sapphire mission as well. And basically, what I'm going to give you is a very very much a fire hose treatment of the SSA in the last 10 years. I say this is the SSA for the last 10 years because you guys have your meeting on the regular time when I meet and try coffee each night. So <laughs> anyways, you're going to see basically what we've been up to for quite some time. So the problem is pretty big. I don't look at stuff that's too far out into space. 40,000 kilometers is about as far as we go. Everything in green is the stuff that mankind has put there. And that's the stuff that on a day-to-day -day basis, dating forces have to care about to know whether or not something might fly into a satellite in orbit. Canada has uh, satellites out there that provide communications, that provide missile warning, that provide uh, navigation, and basically a lot of services to even to, to civil society that are very, very important. And what we really care about is making sure that they're there. There's so much debris in space now, we have to care about this. The Canadian Space Agency vets collision warnings every day and we have to actually figure out whether or not those dots are actually going to intersect in orbit. And that's a big problem. One telescope's not going to do it, a lot of them don't. The problem is changing, too. Next slide. The security event, the security in space, the security situation in space is changing. We're starting to see the reappearance of anti satellite weaponry. And uh, what you're seeing, seeing here is the actual trajectory of the orbital paths of the large fragments of debris spawn that came off of the Chinese anti-satellite test back in 2007. You can see where Canada's radar sat started doing these swan dives within one orbital revolution of that event. That's how much energy is tied up in these objects. When they collide at 7, 10, 15 kilometers per second, they cause catastrophic damage to these vehicles that we put in orbit. They cost tens or hundreds of millions of dollars a piece, and we have to start worrying about the third-party effects when something like this goes on. There was another event that happened about two years later where two satellites accidentally collided. It wasn't an intentional event like this one. And we have to start dodging those events. And as more and more debris starts building in orbit, we have to start monitoring it more and more frequently to make sure and make sure in depth that these collisions aren't going to happen. So the government of Canada's engagement in SSA started out with national defense and Canadian forces. We used to provide telescope observations with the Victor Gun telescopes uh, located in St. Margaret's, New Brunswick, and Pearl Lake, Alberta. Uh, these telescopes were film-based. They lasted about until the 90s until CCD came along and those film-based systems became obsolete. Uh, in the 1990s, the Canadian forces contributed personnel to the missile warning radar community that basically doubles as the space surveillance tracking capability for uh, the United States uh, Space Surveillance Network. But in the 2000s, we got back into the game again. We started building telescopes, but recognizing that this is about the tiny way you do, putting a telescope on the ground in Canada is not much fun when you're trying to see stuff in space, because there's always nothing to do with the clouds. So we put ours in orbit. And we put two of them in space, Sapphire and Neosat, and I'll talk a little bit about those later. Uh, the Canadian Forces also has a protect and defend role in regarding Canadian space systems of national interest. Therefore, we have to monitor and track objects that are our own and our allies in space to make sure they're protected. The, um, the organization that I come to, DRDC, I work at DRDC Ottawa. It's located out in the west end of Ottawa. We're kind of tucked away where, around where the old Martel building used to be out there. Um, my very small group out there has the job of monitor or doing research in space operations, which is basically understanding what's happening in space. Um, we also uh, we built the ground-based optical radar, sorry, the ground-based optical telescopes, which are an array of uh, network telescopes that contributed data operationally to space surveillance network for a few years. Uh, but more recently, we've been doing work with the NEOSAT microsatellite, which is a space-based telescope, small aperture, quite affordable, and a lot of fun to use them. And uh, we've been using this system to basically do this kind of measurement in situ in orbit. The Canadian Space Agency also has a role to play in, in uh, this uh, field. The TSA is a operator of satellites for the government of Canada. They have to vet and monitor collision warnings for any of the satellites that they operate. And for the satellites that do have the ability to maneuver, sometimes they will issue a uh, thruster command to the spacecraft to actually have it dodge spacecraft. 
we have done this, and this is something that we have to uh, forecast. So this is where every close approach for four years happened back in, uh, in the time span of 2010 and 2013. But you can see that in low Earth orbit, mostly hugging the Earth under 1,000 kilometers, we concentrate mostly over the North and South Poles. That's just because most satellites tend to be highly inclined orbits. They tend to be have their orbits passed across those locations. So that's where most of the uh, that's where most of the low Earth orbit uh, conjunctions occur. Canada has a lot of satellites located out in geosynchronous orbit. Telesat Canada and SEAL operate assets out there, and they do so not just above North America, but right around the world. You can actually see the three dots right over Asia here. So it's important for us to have a lot of understanding, not just above North America, but to actually be able to track over longitudes that are not that are on the other side of the planet. And that's where space based capabilities come into play. The area that Canada is responsible for, for tracking objects in space, is that deep space mission area. We're tracking out in geosynchronous orbit. So a lot of the imagery and the stuff that you're going to see here is mostly looking at geosynchronous satellites. The Space Surveillance Network is the U.S. Uh, affiliation of sensors that has the job of tracking all of this stuff in space. And it's basically an arrangement of 20 plus sensors all over the world. And its job is to basically track all those objects using both radars and telescopes. The missile warning radars that perimeter North America, they primarily track all the stuff that's close into the Earth, low Earth orbit. They basically beam beam up energy, they hear a radar echo, and they basically say how far away an object is. The machine that you see on the right is called GEODS. These are the electrical optical telescopes that the US Department of Defense operates for tracking geosynchronous orbit. They're about one meter class instruments. Uh, had the opportunity of actually sitting in the dome with one of these things operating, and it's quite a remarkable machine to see in operation. The turbo motors that drive this thing, um, they're probably about three or four horsepower apiece, and you can hear these things crashing over, driving that big one ton instrument around. It's pretty, pretty impressive to see it in operation. But anyways, these are the telescopes that are used primarily for tracking stuff farther out. Telescopes are more efficient for looking at things deep out in space. The sun is the illuminator, and we see the reflected sunlight back on the ground, and that's how that works. Now, Canada has to do things a little bit differently. Who here has actually gone out on any given night, actually saw the sky? Here. Pretty much. So, all right, so anyways, we had to engineer around this a little bit, so the best thing we could do is let's put our telescope on a small satellite, and we did this twice now. So, SAFIRE is the operational capability of national defense. Uh, it's a it's a, uh, it's a capability that we're always transmitting observations on deep space satellites uh, on orbit. It's, uh, it can see down to objects of magnitude 16. So just to translate that into a satellite size, that's about one meter objects, about 40,000 kilometers away. It's pretty sensitive. Uh, the accuracy of it is about one and a half arc seconds. Uh, if you were to, when I'm explaining this to the Canadian forces, uh, to the Canadian forces of the Air Force, they usually say, well, basically that's a sniper able as a sniper able to hit a wing at 4.2 kilometers. So that's pretty much the accuracy in terms of angular accuracy of this thing. It's fast out of uh, 22 wing North Bay, but this sensor in the middle here is NEOSAT. This is an R&D capability that I'm, I'm the principal investigator for. It's a dual mission micro satellite. We, uh, we built it to look at satellites and to look at asteroids. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. We also own uh, three uh, ground-based telescopes, they're robotic. Um, they're uh, located in Alberta, and there's another one in Belcourt, Bay, Quebec. We have one here in Ottawa, too. And these sensors uh, are primarily used for R&D now, but they were contributors to the Space Surveillance Network for some, some time ago. Uh, we're moving away from classic CCDs, though. We're moving into very high frame rate cameras, like EM CCDs or uh, CMOS, or even in some cases, infrared. So this is what uh, the imagery looks like. It's not the prettiest astro photo that you've probably seen here at these, uh, at these, uh, at these meetings. These dots that you see here are three Canadian geosynchronous satellites. They're about 45,000 kilometers away. So you can't get one cluster of 107 miles. And these satellites are basically broadcasting communications and uh, um, satellite internet and geosat internet and so forth back in the ground. You'll notice that uh, we streak the stars in the background. That's intentional. That's because we want to concentrate that starlight on a small little set of pixels to find those faint little satellites far out into space. So we have to do this in order to see it with these small aperture instruments. Now once we actually uh, take an image like this and put it into the computer, 
and centroids and centers of and dots and the streets and all this, all these images to transform it into right ascension and declination, the same thing that we've got to deal with all the time when we're supposed to telescopes and all the same time. We package all that up, we transmit it off to the Canadian Space Operation Cell, so they can do it, with the, and they can put that into uh, an orbit destination tool that will basically forecast the positions of these satellites in the future, and that's the whole name of the game here. So this is the ground-based optical telescopes. Uh, we built this uh, starting in 2002. We finished, uh, we finished it actually in 2011. It took us a while to get the uh, system, system right. The sensors were contributors to the Space Surveillance Network for about three years up until the launch of Sapphire. When Sapphire was launched, we had to shut the sensors down operationally because the funding was cut off. So it was, anyway, that's just the way, the way of the economics of that work. The uh, sensors are basically the same thing that you'd use for high-end amateur astronomy equipment same thing that you would use. Uh, we are starting to break into some new technologies with, this, uh, with these uh, sensors. Now, we're using EMCCDs on the sensor here in Ottawa right now. We're frame about 20 frames per second. We're trying to zoom quickly to the sky now to uh, do some specialized uh, observations of satellites that get really close together far away. We're starting to see satellites doing that. They're starting to interact in space right now. Honorable servicing and those kinds of things are starting to take place. So we have to use different technologies now. To do so. My favorite though is up in Belcarche, this uh, observatory here, we have a shortwave infrared camera in the back of that one. This one operates during the day now. I don't, I don't have to get up at 2 in the morning anymore to go looking for a satellite that's going to pass overhead at a certain time. We can actually start running these sensors during the day. And right now we're sitting down to about magnitude 9 right now with the sensor in the So this is uh, some, some imagery of uh, an event that happened last year. This is uh, the EMC-9 satellite. It's a geosynchronous satellite that mysteriously jumped <coughs> in altitude by about 10 kilometers and started drifting and spiraling uncontrolled out of geosynchronous orbit. Yes, this does happen with $200 million satellites. So it does occur. And it occurred actually four times in 20, uh, 2017. The satellite in the lower right is MX-6. And EMC-9 actually did spirals around 200 Canadian satellites during its little drift, uncontrolled drift out in orbit until the operators were actually able to get that satellite under control. And you might notice something about the MC9. You see that it's kind of changing brightness? We rely on that. If you take the photometry of uh, that satellite, you see that it's periodic. And when I look at light curves from satellites like this, I immediately know that I see a variation of greater than a magnitude or more. That satellite is uncontrolled. So without even having to talk to the operators, I can just basically take the light curve in that satellite and basically find out whether or not it's under control or not. So a lot of the equipment that you're using, you can infer this stuff yourself if you decide to take the time and the patience to actually sit down and record this kind of thing. You'll see a lot. There's a lot happening just 40,000 kilometers or less um, to right above you. So I talked a lot about geosynchronous uh, orbit right now. I'm just going to lower altitude a little bit. Uh, last year, we had the opportunity of watching a satellite, a nanosatellite, that uh, was operated by the University of Toronto actually change shape. I think everybody here might have heard about the nanosatellite explosion that's happening right now. There's a lot of small satellites that are basically heading into low Earth orbit. These platforms are really cheap, and we're getting a lot more operators who are starting to put them into orbit right now. And it's creating some really neat commercial businesses and so forth. And it's, it's pretty cool stuff. The problem is these things, when they're about the size of bread, about the size of a loaf of bread, they're basically little cannonballs when you put them on orbit. And when you put them at about 800 kilometers altitude, they will want to stay there for a very, very, very long time. So you basically are putting long-term debris in orbit. So back in 2010, we invested uh, money into the University of Toronto to basically try out something with their Canx7 nano satellite. And it was pretty simple. Just put a drag sail on the thing, grab that rarefied, tenuous or atmospheric gas that's up there and try to pull it out of orbit. And that was one of the intentions of this experiment, and it's working right now. Canx7 deployed the sail last year, and we're seeing it drop out of orbit at the rate of about 50 meters per day right now. We're expecting it to be in the next few years. Now, before we, uh, before we get to that finding, though, we actually watched Canx7 deploy the drag sail. By coordinating the experiment between ourselves at the RDC, uh, the University of Toronto and the Royal Military College. And when Canx7 was flying over Canada, I took the 
the um, it comes out the observer from the Yashkan at seven horizon over the horizon, and we basically track the object during the first sail deployment. Now, one thing I just want to set expectations here: we don't see the sails in the video; we just see the dot. That's basically the, the technology that we have to live with, unfortunately. Uh, but anyways, the um, you are able to actually see the narrow satellite change shape. To me, that's really important because small satellites changing shape or reconfiguring themselves is something I want to know about. And especially if I got a Canadian satellite doing it, I was willing to pay a little bit of money to actually do this. So what, you, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you uh, what we recorded uh, that day. What you see on the left here is basically the frames from our telescopes on the ground. Uh, this is from the Ottawa telescope, and this is the light curve generated from the satellite. This is just the animation I put together in the satellite tool kit to get to show the place. I am high in the That's the University of Toronto speaking. Hear the dome rum grumbling in the background. Magnitude increase of two, just brightened by two magnitudes. RZ can confirm brightness increase. Confirm optical change on CMX7. Looks like a first sale for you guys. Congratulations. So the next time you're out looking at the stars, don't just always think about everything's happening light years away in terms of what you're looking at. There's a lot of cool stuff that's happening just a few hundred or even a thousand kilometers above you, and the Canadians are all over it, just so you know. So that's just pretty much. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the space-based stuff that we work with right now. So um, Sapphire is the operational capability of national defense. Uh, this is a satellite where we have Canadian Forces officers and uh, non-commissioned members actually operating on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, this satellite, under that uh, red baffle that you see there, uh, is actually a 15-centimeter uh, off-axis three-meter Aristignac telescope, which is designed to basically work in the uh, low Earth orbit environment to track satellites in deep space. The images it produces looks a lot like what you see on the ground, except they tend to be a little peppery because of the radiation environment up there. It's about the size of a uh, washing machine. Um, it's probably the most elegant uh, description I can basically say of the vehicle. It's actually a pretty impressive build. The, um, it's a, it flies in a sun synchronous orbit about 786 kilometers, so it's not really that high up. Um, if you track it with your own ground based system, you can actually see it from your ground based telescope. The, um, it uh, can see about 360 objects in about 24 hours. It produces about six images uh, per, per frame. And uh, every 10 seconds or so, the satellite is taking, snapping an image of geosynchronous satellites and then transmitting that data back down to the ground segment so the operators uh, will take the imagery, uh, convert it into observations, and send it off to the US Space Surveillance Network. The US Space Surveillance Network takes that uh, data they transform it into a prediction as to where the satellites are going to be in the future, and we just keep on doing this day in, day out. So there's probably about 4,000 objects that we track with uh, Sapphire every two to three days. So Sapphire is, important, is of course, is a part of a larger system. Um, the sexy part of any satellite system, of course, is the satellite, but you are nothing without those ground-based antennas in the ground system. So the, these are the key parts that come out of the system. We have one antenna in Guilford, England, and there's another one in Abbotsford, D.C., which downlinks data from Sapphire. It goes to the data processing at Richmond facility that we call Detweiler. The data is shot off to North Bay, just about three hours from here. Uh, Canadian Forces members will process and transfer the data to another network that goes down to the U.S. Space Surveillance Network, and the U.S. Joint Space Operations Center receives the data, and we keep on participating in that out. Uh, network. So then I'll talk about the other space surveillance sensor that flew with Sapphire on the same rocket now, or close to, on the same rocket. Uh, NEOSAT stands for the Near Earth Orbit Space Surveillance Satellite. It's a pretty long acronym, but basically what it is, it's an R&D microsatellite where we were testing microsatellites to do a militarily useful job in space. The project is a joint project between the Canadian Space Agency and National Defense. 
we've got the money because we want to test the microsatellite platform as a, well, basically as a way for the government of Canada to do experimentation in phase two. Now, the big difference between a large satellite and the microsatellite class is you may look at them and say, well, there's not a lot of physical differences, but internally, we're actually using commercial grade electronics in there, which is the same kind of electronics that's more largely controlling the empty computers of power, actually. So there's a lot of similarities there. They're single string, we don't have a lot of redundancy on board. But inside that package is a uh, is basically a, uh, a computer and a lot of other parts that controls the telescope. We can look see that uh, telescope pretty much every day looking at interesting things happening up in the geotechnical orbit. Uh, there's uh, two objectives. One was to test the microsatellite platform for doing deep space catalog maintenance, or basically sustaining and tracking the orbits of objects in space. And the second one was to do space-based experiments that you can't do from the ground. So it was great. We got the money for doing this. We put the sensor in space. It's a great place to be doing space situational awareness. You're actually sitting in the kitchen with things that you want to actually take a look at. So this is what the instrument looks like when you take the solar arrays off. It gets kind of bland looking when you take the solar, solar arrays off, but the major equipment that you're seeing here, we have a baffle that basically shelters a lot of the bright light that comes off of the limb of the Earth when we're tracking objects in space. Uh, it's got an aeroblaze paint on the interior of that baffle. And I looked down the baffle once when during the testing at the David Floyd lab right here in the left end. And it's kind of creepy because you see this mirror kind of floating off in the distance, but you see nothing else around it. It's kind of creepy to see something that black surrounding the something. The telescope is under this MOI tinfoil material that you see there. It's a 15 centimeter uh, telescope, it's a six inch maxitop that we're flying in orbit. We cool the CCD using a radiator. I think everybody here is familiar with the little thermoelectric coolers on the back of the CCD and that leads heat away from the CCD on most of your telescopes. We can't, there's no air to move in space, so we rely on conduction and radiation to dump heat into the ambient environment. So we have to use these special surfaces for doing that. The avionics uh, can be data handling, power, attitude control system, tracking, telemetry control, it's all sandwiched in this uh, stack of avionics packages here. And that forms the backbone of the look at. And that's basically what controls and steers and operates the instrument in space. This is where we basically look in space. Uh, we look, we track geosynchronous objects pretty much anywhere in this belt, except in here. That's the, that's the red zone. That's looking towards the sun. So I think everybody's first rule of the telescope is you do not look at the sun with your telescope. The second rule of telescopes is do not look at the sun. Well, the same thing in space. We don't want to go on the stuff with it. So anyways, we always stay outside of the solar exclusion zone. And we can track pretty much anywhere else as long as we have stars in the background to track with. So what does an image from NeoSat look like when it comes raw off the detector? Pretty hideous looking, isn't it? What you're seeing is five years worth of radiation hits on that detector sitting in that radiation environment in space. And we've got a really good video at the end here showing you why that occurs over time. So the speckling that you're seeing here is, hot, is basically um, high dark current that comes because of uh, uh, a CCD crystal bombarded by high radiation and charged particles continuously, and they generate dark current at a crazy accelerated growth. We do have a shutter on board NeoSat to mitigate it, but we actually do a different trick to do, to do this. What we do is we take six images like this all in quick succession, and then we basically take what we call NeoSat's dark, which is basically the minimum of the pixel in each one. That basically gets rid of most of the hot pixel and dark current, uh, hot pixel current. From there, uh, we do a Fourier transform and match filter. This is just basically a mathematical trick that we play to figure out where the stars are in the background. And from there, we basically use the orbital data on the satellites that we're tracking to basically uh, uh, find the satellites in each image, and we form our observations. We send that off to the Canadian Space Operations Center or the other researcher that wanted that data, and that's how we form, uh, form observations. It's pretty simple. The uh, image processing code was written in MATLAB. It's called SCRIB3. Uh, it stands for Semi-Quick Intelligent Detector. I don't come up with these acronyms, so I think someone else wanted me to do that. So anyways, um, the, uh, this is basically the overall sequence of events that take place when we look at the images. So um, what we, the application where we found that NeoSat is very well suited to is, is that it's very good at staying on geosatellites and following them for 
long periods of time. Sapphire is kind of like a hummingbird. It spends a few seconds at one spot, and goes off to another spot, and goes off to another spot, and off to another spot. And this sat's a little different. We operate this satellite by watching a couple of satellites and staying and dwelling on them for long periods of time. Last summer, we did that to our advantage. We were able to look at the AMC-9 satellite that we already knew was having trouble in orbit, but we were just basically doing follow-up observations on it. And we found something unexpected. This object seen here didn't correlate in the catalog. And what we detected was it was a fragmentation, a piece of fragmentation debris that came off of AMC-9 that was released probably about a day or two prior. So by following and keeping an eye on objects in space, by situating the sensors above the clouds, where you have the opportunity to frequently revisit these objects, we're able to pick out something that was falling apart in space. Uh, US observers also saw this event too. They saw it. Uh, the object actually disappeared a short time afterwards, though. It was believed to be a piece of frost or something else that may have actually vaporized or ionized in, uh, in space after it was released. They're not entirely sure what, what caused it. So it was large and bright, whatever came off of the satellite. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the advantages of being in situ with your satellite. I talked earlier about conjunction, satellites getting very, very close to one another. Well, I'm going to show you an example of what one of these looks like, but it's from the point of view of Neosat. But every week, we get a warning from the US Strategic Command saying, your satellite's about to be destroyed. Well, thank you, that was that $25 million that we spent. But anyways, the, um, basically every week, we'll have an event where Neosat will get close to another satellite. And this is one that we saw last summer. This is the SPOT2 satellite hurling towards Neosat at about 12 kilometers per second. What you see on the right, is this blob, which is spot two, bloom saturating our detector on Neosat. It got so bright that it starts throwing up, uh, it starts throwing uh, internal reflections in the telescope tube. You actually see the secondary mirror reflections down here on the interior of it. So we're doing some pretty cool stuff with the vehicle since we got it to orbit. And we've even done some even cooler stuff. What you're looking at here is actually uh, frames of sapphire with respect to Neosat we took last summer. So we're starting to do some very, very neat, tricky stuff with the vehicle since we got it to orbit. What you're looking at it is basically um, Neosat and sapphire launch from the same rocket. So they're more or less in the same orbit. Except one is slightly lower in altitude by about 500 meters. Or so. So one satellite kind of shoots ahead of the other and does one, does one lap around the Earth before the other. But every 14 months, they get close to one another. And in this instance, <laughs> Uh, myself and Stefan Dorsch and my colleague who works with me on Neosat, we said, you know what, let's take a few shots at, uh, at Sapphire and see what we can see. Well, we overexposed it, we couldn't see anything. But uh, we were able, we were successfully able to track it, and we were able to actually get some tracking data off of uh, a few frames. The sa Sapphire was only, was anywhere from 8 to 50 kilometers away when we took these frames. So we're starting to try out a new area of space surveillance that very few have been able to do in orbit. Uh, this is actually very timely because we're starting to see the appearance of uh, basically on-orbit servicing activities taking place in space where you have satellites with uh, robotic manipulators or even just cameras coming up close to other satellites, taking pictures of them, or in some instances, they're actually going to grab them, repair them, refuel them, or do some other exotic stuff. So anyways, we're starting to dabble with that kind of technology a little bit without having to launch another vehicle. So it's just a pretty lucky virtue that we flew on, we flew Neosat on the same launch as Sapphire with two cooperative vehicles that can try out this sort of thing. So I'll talk a little bit about some of the astronomical support we've been doing with Neosat. The uh, original near-Earth space surveillance mission that flew with, with Neosat uh, was intended to do some asteroid astronomy by looking towards so 45 degrees from the sun. And uh, the, that mission didn't really go off very well. We looked, when we got to orbit, we found that the sensor wasn't as sensitive as we thought it would be. There was noise injected from the solar array on directly onto the detector that we didn't catch during pre-flight. So unfortunately, that did not pan out. Right now, the University of Bishops and the University of Victoria have taken up the astronomy lead on the Neosat mission, and the Canadian Space Agency supports their engagement with the vehicle. And right now, University of Bishops is doing some exoplanet detection by following up the NASA test mission um, transits with, uh, with, uh, with uh, that vehicle. Um, 
the documentation below is uh, looking at uh, basically exoplanet detections and doing follow-up observations with the NEOSAT NEOPA. And uh, David Allen out at the University of Victoria is doing some asteroid and tr comet tracking with the vehicle as well. We're very well placed in orbit. We have this exotic baffle that's doubled on, on the vehicle that allows us to look very close to the sun. So we can go looking for asteroids that nobody else can. So that's one of the advantages of having the, uh, the uh, vehicle in place. Uh, if anybody is interested, the NEOSAT data is available on what we call the open data server. On If you want to copy down that long FTP address, that's where you can see the text files that we generate for NEOSAT. You can download and play with this kind of uh, data in whatever software package that you have. And it's available, the astronomy data is available for download if, if you're interested there. So I'll talk about one interesting uh, experiment we supported uh, last year. In uh, 2017, there was an asteroid called 2012-PC4. It made this pass by the Earth. It missed us by about 44,000 kilometers. So it was, a, it, was a, it was a pretty close pass. It was only about a rock about 10 meters wide. It had a rotational period of about 12 minutes or something like that. Uh, but uh, the interesting thing about this object is that there was a whole pile of ground-based observatories all watching this thing. And the entire exercise was focused on trying to find out, well, let's test the communications pathways between the observatories and the NASA Planetary Defense Office to see whether how well we can do this kind of job to see if, we, if, if there was a real collision threat to the Earth, what would happen. We actually learned quite a bit with it. Our job with NEOSAT was to uh, basically track this object when it was on the day side of the Earth. You can see uh, one track of, uh, so you can see an image of uh, PC4 here on the lower left of the screen. And we tracked on the day side uh, just as the object was passing over the South, South Pacific Ocean. So it was a pretty fun experiment. Uh, the astronomers, it was pretty, the first exposure to one of these kinds of uh, planetary defense, uh, uh, planetary defense uh, experiments. It was pretty neat after, when the object was three days out, the astronomers knew we were within 500 meters where this thing was going to cross the Earth. So if this thing was actually going to collide with the Earth, we had to pretty much know which country this thing was going to hit the atmosphere of. So it's pretty impressive what you can do with that kind of data. Um, when you have a little bit of time to uh, play with it and so forth. So I'm going to finish up uh, showing you some images of uh, Comet 46P or 10. We took observations on that comet before the acquisition in December pretty much every week for um, uh, since October of this year. Um, you can see a little bit of the tail starting to form on the uh, on these images here. But you notice that, uh, that the object doesn't quite follow a straight line in the path when it's in the images. That's because of the parallax of NEOSAT's orbit. NEOSAT does this big orbit around the Earth, and since the object is in the mirror field compared to the stars, it does these little bunny hops compared to the stars. And, um, and uh, basically, the, the minor planet astronomers love that kind of thing, because it's basically the same as three days worth of tracking data, all compressed into one orbit for NEOSAT. So it works out pretty well for us. You also notice that there's something else in the background. See that speckling that you see there? Those are radiation hits on our detector. Those are high energy protons that are basically bombarding the NEOSAT instrument continuously while we're on orbit. And uh, occasionally you'll see this little snowstorm play up every once in a while. That's, our, that's NEOSAT flying through a particularly hot area that's centered over Brazil, where there's uh, a, a feature called the South Atlantic Anomaly, where there's a, basically a short circuit of high energy protons from the magnetosphere right into our upper atmosphere. You'll see it here as that snowstorm event from time to time on the images. So I'll just let that play out here, and I'll be happy to finish up here. If there's any questions, I'll be happy to take some questions, and I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to present today. How do you point NeoSat? Uh, well, you have to give it a good kick some days. <laughs> but uh, usually what you do is you just tell it right ascension, declination, and rolling. That's what it comes down to. How do you orient it? Do you oh. gas jets? Or, or nope, there's uh, reaction wheels on board. Right. So basically we just spin up little wheels, and the change in angular momentum is what steers the vehicle.
a good presentation, thank you. Uh, when you're deploying a solar sail on a satellite like that, how are you controlling its uh, rate of descent so it's not crossing into the path of uh, lower traffic? Uh, you can't really do that. So um, uh, that is a very fair question. The, uh, uh, there is no propulsion capability on CanX-7. Now, the benefit that when they deployed that satellite, it was around 730 kilometers, I think. It was, it was, it was not quite at 830. That's where you don't want it to be able to cross that. It was actually in an orbital regime where the density of objects is much lower. So it actually poses a lower risk of collision, even though you pretty much uh, increase the size of the satellite 100 fold. So it's actually in a lower density regime when you open up the solar cell. Uh, they can change the orientation and spin rate of the vehicle uh, during the sail deployed, but there is no thrusting or no propulsion capability on board CanX-7, so we're relying on Sir Isaac Newton. You mentioned about uh, you tie yourself in this. Is there any other organization in Canada working on the microsats or nanosats? Absolutely. Um, there is a, well, a pile of them now, actually. Uh, when I started in, um, in 2007, we used to be Dynacon Incorporated. Uh, part of that company transitioned into Microsat Systems Canada. Uh, what used to be ComDev, they built the other uh, satellites that we funded at DRDC called M3MSAT, which is a satellite that listens for transmissions from ships. Uh, There's something I didn't know about ships, but they actually talk to each other on this, on this VHF band. And if you're sitting in space, you can hear it. And so anyways, uh, uh, ComDev built a satellite to basically listen into that kind of activity. Uh, there's, um, there's another uh, manufacturer in Quebec, and the name escapes me right now. They built the Cobra satellite. Uh, they were just out in space outside Montreal. Uh, there's, there's Kepler Communications in Toronto now. And there's also several university initiatives with the Canadian SmallSat CubeSat project that's uh, kicked off with the Canadian Space Agency right now. One thing that you should really understand is that these small, low-cost platforms have really taken off in the last few years. The, economies, the economy of this has really changed. We're seeing a lot more smaller platforms that you can just build on a lab bench. You don't need these big, giant hangars with multi-ton cranes anymore to move and manipulate these spacecraft anymore. You can build a satellite in your garage now if you're so, if you, uh, if you have the time and, and, the, and a little bit of cash to do it. You you can do that kind of thing. Uh, launch costs are about $50,000 a kilogram, and if you've got your pockets deep enough, and instead of buying a Winnebago, you can buy yourself a launch on a so you can trade it. So um, it's an option. Uh, just a curiosity question. If we didn't launch any more satellites, how long would it take for every satellite we have now to deteriorate? Well, the ones in geosynchronous orbit, they'll be out there for about 15,000, 20,000 years. The ones in low Earth orbit, the low Earth orbits, uh, well, just for, well, here's where I incriminate the government of Canada, actually. The Neosat will basically stay on orbit for about another 80 years. So it will be up there for a long time. The lower in altitude you are, the spacecraft will reenter quicker. So, uh, so anyways, that's basically the rule of thumb. If you're under 660 kilometers, we're in nine times out of 10 satellites that will reenter in 25 years. But you're at 800 kilometers, 100 years is not unreasonable. 1,000 kilometers or 1,200 kilometers, you're talking hundreds of years, maybe even thousands of years. So just a follow-up question to what you just uh, actually answered. Um, the exploded Chinese satellites, um, how long do we expect the debris to be in space? A and also, um, is the risk of collision with other satellites going to increase or decrease over time? The, the thing I want to see, the intercept that happened in 2007, um, the, the entire global community has to worry about that now, even the Chinese. After that intercept occurred, there was an instantaneous increase of about 3,000 objects that we can track as soon as that event occurred. Uh, some of those objects, they actually re-entered within half of an orbit. Some of them re-entered very quickly. Others will be up there for probably another, probably several hundred years. But others are re-entering. Every day there's one object that re-enters. Either it's 1001C debris or other objects that were put in orbit in the US, Russia, or any of the other nations that all participate in this environment. So, um, so it depends on the altitude and the shape of the orbit, but in, 
if I was an average man like seeing the Buddha object, it could be it could be fifty to one hundred and fifty years, depending on depending on the size and the mass of the object. All right, one last question. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah, it's perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It was a very interesting presentation. Thanks for taking the time to uh, present for us. All right, so we are going to go to break. Uh, we have calendars for sale. There's, uh, I think, five or so left. So hopefully they're all gone so that uh, somebody doesn't have to take them home. Um, so it is 8.19. Uh, uh, let's meet back at 8.30 to get the uh, second half of the meeting going. Alrighty, let's get the uh, second half of the meeting going. Uh, so first, first up, we're going to have uh, Dan Vasu. Vasu. Um, he's going to take us through some outreach that uh, he was a part of uh, internationally. Dan. Thank you. Thank you. I'll start with a short intro. I've been a member of OTA RIC for uh, almost two years now, and uh, thanks to the organization and the uh, amazing people I met through this uh, club, uh, I progressed from knowing basically almost nothing about the sky to knowing quite a lot. 
And my next few slides will just show how uh, uh, this support that the Ottawa RIC provides to basically anybody who has an interest to astronomy, it's the right place to come. In this uh, slide, uh, I guess you recognize uh, the Starfinder charts that usually Mike hands out to public outreach and there's this uh, magazine uh, related to meteor showers that uh, I got from uh, another RISC member, Pierre Martin, who most of you know is very passionate uh, about the meteors. And uh, somehow these uh, materials uh, ended up supporting an astronomy event in a Romanian school in Bucharest. Uh, my girlfriend is a teacher in Romania and she teaches uh, grade two kids. She also has an interest in astronomy and she thought of doing this extracurriculum activity about astronomy with the kids. And uh, I had these few materials from the local club here and I thought they would be useful. And uh, she was wondering in the beginning if uh, maybe half of the kids would uh, have any interest in this, but in the end, it turned out they were all uh, very excited and captivated, and it was a big success. And uh, I guess the next few pictures will prove it. Uh, I think this is all I have. And basically, with these slides, I just wanted to show you that uh, your support can reach uh, far away and you may not realize it sometime, and uh, like in this case, few thousand kilometers. And uh, so keep doing the good work, and thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much, Dan. That's, uh, it's fantastic to see uh, sort of the, the faces of all those kids lit up with, with excitement uh, about astronomy. It's, it's good to start them young, they say. All right, up next, I'm gonna be calling on our past president, Tim Cole. It looks like someone didn't remove him from the auditorium after all. Uh, and he's gonna be, <laughs> he's gonna be taking us uh, through the excitement of the upcoming lunar eclipse. Tim, take it away. Yes, okay. Well, happy perihelion, everybody. Um, all right, that went over wonderfully, um, okay. <laughs> Um, observing the next lunar eclipse, which won't look anything like this because it will be cloudy. Yes. No. No. Positive. Yeah, I am positive it will be cloudy. Okay. No one buy any equipment between now and then, please. Yes, exactly. And if you if and returning it doesn't count. Yeah, there we go. Um, that actually is a really nice picture of um, an eclipse from Athens, which happened to be a central eclipse. And uh, I'm hoping we'll have something that will be just about as nice in terms of uh, a nice rosy color. I, I like that color better than practically anything else. Uh, the really pitch black ones are kind of a pain in the butt. Um, there we have a little timetable of it. Anybody who says they can see a penumbral eclipse <laughs> yeah, never mind. Um, but the umbral is always good fun. Um, and as you can see from here, uh, we're fairly close to the center, so we've got a, a reasonably long uh, central portion, um, which is a little on the dull side, but you can actually get a fair degree of change in, uh, in the color and tone during the uh, totality. So it'd be interesting to see what happens, and that's partly what I like about the, uh, the color. Um, I put some timing on this. You'll find that this timing chart is used in uh, all the standard eclipse documentation, um, going from the penumbral stage one to the penumbral stage four, and you'll find that all in, in most of the standard stuff. However, what you'll also find is first, second, and third, and fourth contact with respect to the umbra. So you. Um, I think that's the most useful because nobody can see a penumbral eclipse worth mentioning anyway. Ingress and egress, to my mind, are always the really fun bits because you're, you know, it's dynamic. You get to watch some intriguing stuff. Um, this, I'm sure most of us already know this, but this is going to come up. Um, people will always wonder why. 
and how it works and why you've got a penumbra and an umbra. Uh, so just the basics of it. Um, we're getting the penumbra and umbra because we've got a distributed source and it's exactly the same effect that you get from seeing a, a light cast, uh, a shadow cast by your door in your office. Same effect. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. We have different classes of eclipse. So we can get anything from a partial penumbral where, as far as I'm concerned, that doesn't exist. A penumbral, which almost doesn't exist. A partial umbral, which is a tease. Um, but actually, I mean, you can still have fun with that. Uh, the umbral and then the central eclipse, which does not mean, incidentally, that the center of the moon has to go through the center of the umbra, just that some portion of the, uh, the moon passes through the center. It, they don't have to coincide. It's drawn that way because I'm a lazy cuss and it's easier to draw it that way. Um, the next one you'll get, I know this is probably going over stuff for most people, but I find you get this when you explain to people that the geometry of the eclipse, the next question that they'll get, that you'll get is, well, why don't you have it every month? And the answer is fairly easy. Um, the moon's orbit is inclined and you have to wait for the lines to interact. Uh, the analogy I always use is taking a coin and spinning it. Um, just like when your spun coin goes wooga 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 before it falls on the table, it's the same thing here. So uh, if that comes up, that's just your quick answer. Uh, it's inclined about five degrees and you have to wait for the lines of nodes to cooperate. And you can see with this one, the simulation is showing the, uh, the shadow of the Earth. Uh, illumination, every now and again, you'll notice uh, a slight blue tinge on the outer portion of it. And the thing with that is in the upper atmosphere, uh, the ozone layer tends to absorb a fair bit of the red and what's left uh, gives you a subtle, uh, a subtle bluish tinge. And then for the lower portion, uh, you're getting the, the red illumination. How much of this depends on everything? Uh, how much crud is in the air? Uh, for example, back in 1992, after Mount Pinatubo did its thing, uh, that particular uh, total lunar eclipse was pitch black. Um, it, you, you could more easily find the eclipse by looking for where the stars weren't because the, the, the moon was that dark. So I'm hoping we'll go for the next stage. And along that line, you can only assess the, uh, the depth of it after the fact. So a fellow named Dan Young came up with his, uh, with his scale going from pitch black, which I find a bore, to copper orange, which is fun, and you might get the bluish. I kind of like a, a, a level three, because I think it's fun for no other reason than that. Uh, crater timing, you can do if you want. Uh, as you watch the, um, the shadows go for and uh, go across the, the surface of the moon. Interestingly enough, there's some value to that because uh, as strange as it sounds, we don't have uh, really good models of predicting the exact width of the umbra. It depends a lot on atmospherics. So having that data around um, is useful for doing um, analysis of how the atmosphere behaves. Um, you will find timings for this in the observer's handbook or else in, um, you know, mrclips.com, any of the standard eclipse stuff. And if you were to see it from the moon, because again, people ask, well, it's sort of that. Uh, you'll have a little bit of red light from the earth and, um, unfortunately, I, I was too lazy to get rid of the glow that starry night puts in for the sun no matter what. You wouldn't actually see that on the moon, of course. But um, it, it's better than having the, the lens flares that you normally get. So again, this is just sort of fun. It's something people have asked a lot, so I've, I popped it in for us. Um, we are setting an event up here, weather permitting, that's it. Jesse's ruined it for everybody. He's put in weather permitting, which wrecks it completely. Um, so. We've got some spots set up here. It is fairly late, as you'll notice, so um, we're not entirely certain what kind of a turnout we'll get. And almost certainly it'll be just for ingress. By the time uh, totality starts, most people will just take a hike and go home. Um, again, we'll be doing that here, so we'll be doing the usual looking for volunteers to come out and uh, you know, do whatever cloud, cloud reduction dances seem appropriate. Um, so enjoy the cloud cover that night because everything should be just, I'm trying to put reverse English on it.
So we'll see. All right, everybody, do enjoy the eclipse. Hope we get a nice one. That's it. I'm out of here. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. I'm just going to go back a couple of slides here. Just because ever since Paul pointed it out, I can't unsee that damn deer. <laughs> the damn deer. The deer that uh, Paul mentioned. Eyes, nose, antlers. I still see it every time I look at the moon now. You've ruined it for me, Paul. Sorry. And I guess what's interesting about this slide is, I guess from the moon, it would be a solar eclipse, which is cool. All right. Observation reports. We've got uh, plenty this month. So if you're on the magic list, if you could get in line over here. And we will be starting with Taras. Happy New Year, everyone. Um, Comet 46P Virtanen has been traveling across the southern skies. Oh, there we go. In December, and uh, those rare occasions when the sky was clear would give us an opportunity to enjoy the sight of it. The picture was taken on December 8th from Bob Olson's observatory in North Augusta, who was very kind to host me and Eric we made that night. Despite the uh, brightness, and uh, in particular, it has reached the magnitude of 4.2 on its closest approach to the Earth. The comet was rather, as you can see, was pretty dull, and uh, it didn't have any prominent features, uh, except, well, for the bright coma. There is a uh, hint of the tail kind of stretching like this a little bit, but, uh, well, it wasn't. Uh, moony light and it was not really high enough uh, in terms of uh, the, the, the contrast of the sky was pretty low so it didn't show up well. Um, there is an animation so the comet was this was taken when the comet was between um, Cetus and Eridanus that night uh, making its uh, path toward Taurus uh, the time-lapse animation, this one consists of uh, about 15 minutes of frames taken uh, 30 seconds uh, each uh, with the interval of 30 seconds. So this comet makes an approach to uh, flyby uh, of Earth every 5.4 years, which means that uh, we could observe it again next time in 2024. Uh, so these constant swings around the sun come with a cost because uh, every time when uh, Virtanen makes it through this, uh, close to the sun, uh, the ice that it consists of melts. And uh, what's, uh, what's left is not enough to um, create a powerful tail or a visual tail because it's been doing that so many rotations so many times that everything which would produce the tail is already blended in, and uh, that's one of the reasons. Uh, also, um, as you can see, so this was taken, uh, the screenshot is actually of uh, January 1st, when the comet was a bit of a distance from the sun, while the closest approach was here on uh, uh, December 16th, when we could see this uh, pretty bright and uh, um, amazing location next to the Pleiades, actually. Uh, so uh, Pleiades on uh, December 16th were perhaps this close to the comet, which was traveling this way. And this would compose a nice picture, but unfortunately, as we all know, it's not our luck to see the clear skies that day when we need it. And this was taken two days later when uh, the comet already traveled quite a distance. Uh, however, these about 20 minutes of exposure altogether, uh, I'm happy that uh, 
when I started actually stacking it, I didn't realize that there is another object here, which is the California Nebula, and uh, dark lanes of dust is a bit seen here. There is dark nebula here, uh, but I'm not sure if it's actually part of this uh, darker stretch of uh, space dust. And Aldebaran here. Um, so um, this was taken on November 24 from Laval, Quebec. The ISS transits cover, uh, of, sorry, over the face of moon and sun happen relatively often, but uh, you have to be in a specific area in specific time to see it's uh, full, which is not really completely full, but pretty wide extent. Uh, this particular one happened around 12.30 a.m. and uh, features 0.6 second duration of the transit and almost an arc minute of uh, ISS angular size, um, which that time resulted in 17 frames, which I stacked later on and superimposed, so each frame is uh, one uh, 30th second of uh, video taken of that uh, transit. Now, um, the, the seeing was not too good. I wanted to improve the image a little bit, so the background is actually stuck, uh, stacked, and so I did with these 17 images, stack them together. Mm. I thought the quality will be a little bit better, but um, it's still pretty fuzzy. So I uh, showed this picture to my friends, and they said, well, I don't, some, some of them said, well, I don't even think it's uh, ISS. So I Googled this image, and uh, apparently, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, uh, it's, it's called a, a twin ion engine X1 fighter manufactured by Cyanar Fleet Systems. Have to be true. Thank you. Thanks, well played there. All right, uh, Rick Wagner, you're up next. So before we get started, show off my new socks. Astronautics, planets, astronauts. You want the light? Step into the light. Step into the light. <laughs> <laughs> so, not often I take time away from my photometry to take a picture of a galaxy, but since there's uh, a new excuse to take a picture of this galaxy, and I talked about it last month, uh, this is M77, and you remember I said it was one of the difficult ones to observe. Uh, you can see it's got a really bright, uh, very uh, central nucleus. And under city skies, this is kind of about what you'd probably see. This is about a half an arc minute wide. The guidebooks say that it's seven, six by seven arc minutes. It's ninth magnitude, so it should be easy, right? Except all the light's concentrated into that star in the center, which is actually its active galactic nucleus, which is a supermassive black hole and uh, doing all sorts of exciting relativistic things. So, with all the light concentrated in there, it doesn't leave much for the rest of the galaxy. So, under poor conditions, you're actually looking for something that's pretty small. So, if we take a, a longer exposure, uh, you can see this is yet more of the galaxy pops out. Nice disk with uh, nice spiral arms. That's the supernova right there, so that's why I was actually taking the picture. And, uh, and the only record I have in my observations of this object is in fact three arc minutes wide uh, with a s stellar core that was from uh, Fred Lossing Observatory uh, back in 1990, in fact almost exactly 11, uh, 21 years ago, uh, New Year's Eve 1997-8. So you can tell what an exciting life I live when I'm out at the observatory <laughs> on New Year's Eve. Uh, so. Then if we stretch this picture even further, this is only a half hour total exposure, so it's not great. But you can see there's a whole bunch more galaxy. And this is the six by seven arc minute thing. So it's pretty faint. I was out uh, Tuesday or Wednesday night with my 12 and a half inch and with the uh, Boltwood 40 centimeter. 
and you know under dark skies it, they're both uh, both showed it quite nicely but it's it's definitely a challenge object so thank you thanks sir uh, next we've got Richard Taylor Okay, so uh, I had a little bit less success with my comet pictures. I was inspired last month by some of the pictures people were showing and th thought, that, oh, maybe I can get a picture of that with my telephoto lens. But first I had to try and spot it with my binoculars. And every clear night we had, those few that we did have, couldn't see a thing. <clears throat> so then I noticed in the uh, plot of the path of the comet that uh, the night after the full moon this month, or that last month, the comet was going to be really close to um, Capella. <clears throat> so I thought, this will make it easy. I can find it. So I get all my equipment together. I find out when the moon's going to rise. And 5.40 was the moon rise. So I said, OK, I've got you know, maybe 20 minutes. I can get out there and get a picture of the comet. So I get out to the experimental farm. It's cloudy again. <laughs> I got a nice picture of Arcturus, because <laughs> that was the only star I could see up in the sky. And I was fiddling with the equipment, trying to get it. And then I noticed this big red glow in the east. So shifted the camera around, and that's what I got. <clears throat> it was a beautiful moon. <laughs> but I never saw the comet that night. And then, of course, uh, Christmas intervened. There were a couple of clear nights, I believe, but uh, I was kind of busy with other things. So it wasn't until the uh, 26, no, 20, 29th of January, my brother was having a party at his house near Athens, Ontario. And I thought, OK, it's going to be clear tonight. I've got to take my equipment with me. So I head out leave the house during the dessert, and whoops, that is uh, what I saw. It's a beautiful clear night. We've got the Pleiades up here. We've got Auriga down here. And the prediction was that the comet should be somewhere over here on its way towards the Big Dipper. Can you see it? Well, I sure couldn't with binoculars. I think it wasn't until I got back in the house and looked at the picture, but yeah. Oh, man. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> it was there. <laughs> so once again, I was having some problems aiming, but I took pictures all over the place in the region that it was supposed to be. And finally, when I got home and processed them all together, that was my best picture. <clears throat> So I did get the comet. <laughs> now naturally, of course, there's so many stars in the sky up there that it was very, very difficult to spot visually. It was not a very prominent comet. So that's my best attempt. Thank you. <laughs> oh, sorry. <Yeah. laughs> While I was out there, uh, I thought I can take something I know I know about. So there's the Orion Nebula too. Was that a meteor in the upper right-hand corner? No, just a, a an aircraft or something. I think a satellite maybe. Right there. Might be a meteor. Oh. <clears throat> Okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Richard. <clears throat> All right. So up next, we've got uh, Jim Sylvia. I did, I did not take this shot. However, it's, it's sort of an introduction to uh, M66 that I did 
take, but I'd just like to begin with this introduction. So this is, in the constellation Leo, this is an image of the Leo triplet, and it's composed of uh, NGC 3628, M66, and M65. And through a wide angle eyepiece, this is really a treat to look at. I'm sure some of you have already uh, seen this. It's, it's, it's quite nice. Uh, the distance between M66 and M65 is 20 arc minutes, or approximately 200,000 light years. And uh, the uh, distance among the three is close enough to have involved some previous gravitational interaction. And what I'm going to show you is uh, some of the reported effects that uh, the uh, gravitational interaction between NGC 3628 and M66 occurred about a billion years ago, apparently. And so, uh, all right. All right. I, Someone on the right. Oh, there we go. So this is a 16-second exposure of M66 that, that I took a number of months ago with the Mallinckham exterminator. Uh, M66 is the brightest and largest member of the LEO triplet. It's approximately 36 million light years away and uh, it has an apparent magnitude of 8.9. It's known for its outstanding dust lanes and um, spiral arms. So apparently, uh, a big time uh, gravitational interaction between NGC 3628 uh, and M66 uh, occurred about a billion years ago. And as a result, uh, M6, the structure of M66 changed. Um, and apparently, what, uh, what had resulted is that this galaxy um, has had uh, its bulge slightly the bulge of the, uh, uh, the center is uh, slightly off to the side. Uh, it has a high central mass concentration, and its arms are asymmetrical, with a clump of interstellar cloud of uh, neural hy uh, neutral hydrogen that apparently was uh, removed or disrupted from one of its spiral arms. And as a result, the galaxy appears to have a conspicuous and unusual structure of spiral arms and dust lanes. And the distorted hooked spiral arms that you see, I believe, right over here, right over there, apparently um, has uh, been displaced and is, uh, and is uh, operating uh, above the plane of the galaxy's disk. So these for these, these oddities, and for this reason, uh, Alton Arp uh, included M66 in his Atlas of Peculiar Galaxies. Um, another interesting trivia item uh, for M66 is that up until now, four supernovae have been detected in M66. The brightest of these at magnitude 12.2, which, which was discovered 30 years ago in January of, two, of uh, 1989. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Yeah. All right, uh, up next we've got Gary Boyle. Happy New Year, everyone. Well, the morning of question, December 16th, it was cloudy. Till about 1 a.m. I was kept watching the app for, uh, and the clear sky chart, and it said 1 a.m. could be one block, one hour. So at 1 o'clock it was, went outside, it was clear till 4 a.m. So I was able to get uh, the comet next to the Pleiades. Just as a little three-dimensional, uh, the comet was about 11 and a half million kilometers from Earth. The Pleiades, 450 light years from Earth, and a light year is 10 trillion kilometers, give or take. So took this on my old, well, Canon Rebel, the uh, 450 or D450, 450D. Uh, it was seven uh, images of 90 seconds, 
stacked together on 135 millimeter uh, fixed lens at about f3. So I'll use the deep sky stacker to stack them and uh, elements tend for, for the processing along with biases and flats which I'm finally experimenting in so it really makes a difference. So uh, I can take a comment off my bucket list and especially up next to Pleiades, uh, really happy with a shot. And I hope a lot of people got to enjoy the comment to any extent, uh, even in the paper, whatever, online, to see something this close, uh, this bright. Seems to be, we get a lot of Christmas comments. We have comment Lovejoy a few years ago, again, next to the Pleiades in, in December, January. So uh, who knows when the next one will be. And uh, let's hope we have clear skies for the eclipse coming up. Thank you all. Thanks, Gary. That's a fantastic shot. All right, up next, uh, we've got Paul. Thank you, Oscar. Well, season's greetings to everybody. I, uh, I'm glad to see uh, a bunch of you got out to, to see uh, the, the comet. Uh, there we are. Um, December was challenging. Uh, I don't need to tell you that, but uh, it was pretty challenging. Uh, the, the, the opportunities that we did get, we did get a few clear nights, but uh, they turned out to be, at least out in my neck of the woods, more like glorified sucker holes uh, that lasted for a few hours, as, as Gary pointed out there. So you gotta, you gotta if you got them, smoke them, basically. <laughs> take, take the chance while you have. Um, the comet is still visible, but uh, what I thought I'd do is, for those of you that, uh, that didn't get a chance to see it, I've got a, a collection of shots here that, that I did take through those sucker holes. And uh, so, you could, so you don't miss out on it. Uh, interesting, uh, with uh, Dr. Scott's uh, presentation there, uh, the last video that he was showing uh, showed you the, the comet uh, up until December the 2nd. And uh, as uh, Dr. Scott pointed out, uh, very little in terms of, of a feature uh, it, within the comet itself, like no, no glorious tail or anything, but, but hints, of a, hints of a tail. This is a shot I showed you uh, last uh, month. It was just taken two days before the meeting, and you can just see a little hint of a tail there, but basically a, a, a glowing sphere. So that was, uh, that was uh, December the 5th. And uh, so I, I tried to get out uh, on every uh, sucker hole that we could because I knew this, uh, this, this, this comet wasn't going to be visible for very long. So uh, a couple of days later, on the 10th, uh, managed to get that with a uh, 300, uh, actually a 300 millimeter lens uh, with a 1.4 extender on it, so 420 millimeters. And uh, again, you can see uh, basically a, a very spherical uh, coma, quite bright in the center there. And, uh, but, but no, no really obvious features there. So I was crossing my fingers for December the 12th and the 16th of December the 12th was when the, when the uh, comet was at perihelion, four days later, closest approach to Earth. And uh, as it turned out, it, I, did, I did get a lucky break on the, on the 12th, the night of the perihelion, and so I managed to put the 11 inch uh, uh, Edge HD on it. And uh, so we zoom in on that and we can have a look. So that's, uh, that's the uh, Night of Perihelion, and you can see that there is a bit of structure there. This is all within the, the coma, as you saw from the, from the previous shot there. The streaks that, the, the streaks that you can see there, uh, I, I did remove the stars, how much is the same as uh, Dr. Scott was talking about with, uh, with his work. Uh, did remove the stars there so we could just focus on the comet, and uh, you can see that there is structural detail in there. Just to give you a sense of scale, too, uh, about this object, this, the original photograph here uh, is 3,000 pixels across. The, the, the nucleus itself of this object would be 1 20th of one pixel in the center of that bright spot. So just to give you an idea of how, how small the, the, the actual nucleus is, this next, this next slide's gonna be a little harsh on your eyes there, but I wanted to do an inverse of this because it's a little easier to see the detail, so stand by for retina fry. So there you can see, it's the same image, just, uh, just done, uh, uh, inverted, so that you can see the structure of, of, the, uh, of what, uh, what little tail there was there. You can see there's a definite uh, there's a definite uh, elongation along that path with a general kind of a fan-shaped brightening there. And at the distance of the comet on this night, which was 11.9 million kilometers, uh, you can see the scale of that. 
um, of that uh, bright area there, or the, the, uh, the, 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 the central coma there, about 10,000 kilometers across at that scale. The nucleus is about one kilometer across, so yeah, it's pretty tiny. So that was December the 12th, and as Gary mentioned, we really lucked out uh, on the 16th because, uh, at least in my neck of the woods, I, I was watching, like Gary, was watching the clouds all day and uh, was wondering if we were going to get a shot at this at all because the placement was beautiful with the Pleiades. And uh, uh, same thing that happened to you, basically at about 12.45, it cleared out and uh, managed to bag a nice wide angle view with a 16 millimeter lens. Uh, so you can see here our, our friend Orion there, you can see some of the red nebulosity there, the, the, the Hyades there with Aldebaran, Pleiades there, and, uh, and our friend the comet. Uh, you can see a bunch of other features there. There's the rosette up there, or the, uh, the California nebula, and the, uh, the rosette up there as well there. So uh, that was very fortunate. It was a little bit later than, than I'd hoped to be shooting, uh, I was starting to get down into the trees there, but I thought, oh, I'll leave the trees in there because they look kind of cool. So th on this night, it was, it was for, for that sucker hole when it opened up, it was very clear and the, and the, and the seeing turned out to be actually really quite nice. Uh, it was easily visible to the naked eye, at least out in my neck of the woods. Uh, obviously with, with binoculars, it was just a, a, a gorgeous sight there. So I, I did have two cameras rolling. I had the 16 millimeter lens here. And my last shot was with a 135, and it cuts in uh, on, on that area there, just so a little bit of a closer view. And there we go, December the 16th, night of closest approach, about 11.5 uh, uh, million kilometers away. So uh, we did get lucky. I did see this thing, uh, this comet, just a few nights ago, so it is still visible. Uh, it, whether it's naked eye, even under a dark sky, is a little bit questionable. It's now about twice as far away from the Earth as it was on this night. Um, but I did see it in the binoculars quite easily. So if you haven't seen it and we get, do get a clear night, we're in a moonless window now, uh, it would be a good time to check it out if, uh, if you really did want to get a, an eyeball on this thing. Um, and I thought it might just be at the threshold of visibility, but especially for younger eyes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. All right. Uh, we're going to move on to our observing challenge. Uh, so I hadn't, I didn't propose any challenge in December, just because I figured everybody would be busy with the holidays, etc. Uh, but the challenges from November were these there, the M31, NGC 6888, Stefan's Quintet, and Mons Hadley and Rima Hadley. Uh, for this month, as our beginner challenge, uh, folks should go out and look at uh, the Orion Nebula. Uh, it's a star-forming nebula in the constellation Orion. Uh, it forms part of the sword of Orion, hanging just off Orion's fashionable belt. Uh, easy object in binoculars and a wonderful object to look at in any telescope. Uh, for our intermediate challenge, uh, I'm proposing people uh, look for Abel 12, uh, which is a planetary nebula in Orion. Uh, magnitude 13.9, uh, it's about 37 arc seconds in size, uh, and it's quite close to Mu Orionis, uh, so it requires quite a clear night, so you're not uh, struggling against the glare of that, of that star. Uh, and it may help to use a UHC or O3 filter to, to help you out. Uh, and for our advanced challenge, uh, oh, I misspelled Able there, but Able Galaxy Cluster 426, it's a galaxy cluster in Perseus. Uh, there are many galaxies in this cluster. Uh, see how many people can spot. Uh, but there are 18 NGC objects, 11 UGC objects, six IC objects, and one PGC object. So quite a few galaxies in that cluster uh, to try to hunt down. Uh, and for our lunar challenge, um, we're going to do craters Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins. So they're located within the Mare Tranquilla Tranquillatus. Uh, near the Apollo 11 uh, landing site. It's best viewed on lunar days uh, 5 and 19. Uh, Armstrong Crater is only about 5 kilometers in diameter. Collins and Aldrin are about 3 kilometers each, so you'll need a probably a fairly like an 8 inch or larger instrument to, to be able to resolve those. All right, so there are, there are the challenges. Again, uh, the Orion Nebula, Able 12, 
Abel 426, and Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins. All right. On to the FLO star parties for members only. The next one is uh, January 5th, weather permitting. I haven't looked at the forecast for tomorrow, so anybody know what that's looking like? Bad? All right. Probably not going to happen. But maybe we'll get all the clouds out of the way now uh, so that we can uh, enjoy the, uh, the, solar, uh, the lunar eclipse, rather. Estelle's pick of the month, Universal. So you can see her uh, and our library just behind the stage here to the right. Uh, here are some of the folks that uh, help keep the club running. Uh, as always, our meetings are recorded and available uh, for viewing uh, in our archive on our website. Uh, thank you to everyone that attended. There were 98 attendees tonight, so thanks very much for coming out on a uh, January evening. Uh, and thanks to all the organizers and speakers. Uh, and once again, I'd like to wish everyone a happy new year. Uh, we're going to have our post-meeting meeting at Grace O'Malley's uh, again. So come out for, uh, to wet the whistle and maybe have a snack and, and some astronomy chat. Uh, I did call them and they are not having any live entertainment tonight like they did the last time, so. <laughs> That's right. Uh, our next meeting is uh, February 1st. Uh, we've got a couple pretty interesting talks. Uh, Dr. Uh, Janet Tullock, one of our members here, is gonna be giving us a, a, a talk uh, entitled uh, Outstanding Standing Stones and how they relate uh, to astronomy. Uh, and also we're going to have uh, Jesse Rogerson giving us sort of a, an overview on the uh, Juno uh, spacecraft and its mission at Jupiter. So that'll be, those will be two talks that uh, should not be missed. Uh, some, some of the benefits of joining the club, you'll have access to the Ted Bean Bone Library where you can borrow a telescope or two and uh, take one out for a spin before you decide whether or not you want to buy one. Get access to our book library and also access to the Fred Lossing Observatory. Additionally, you'll get some interesting publications. Sky News is included with membership, uh, the RAC Journal, a uh, copy of the Observer's Handbook every year, and of course, our very own uh, astronauts. All right, and the, in the moment you've all been waiting for, door prizes.